<coughs> well, we can start, and I wish you all welcome to this uh, lecture by Professor Sir Harry Ladesia. And uh, it's a great honor to welcome you to Luleå, because uh, all of us know about your writings and books and, and articles, and uh, I think all of you, most of you at least, recognize these two books that we have been using in our education. And, uh, so therefore it's a very great honor to have you here to, to uh, give two lectures about this. And, uh, well, your background is long and you, are, you have done a lot of scientific bird work and, uh, and which is of very great importance for all of us. And, uh, well, I think with that I'd like to welcome you once again. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Isa, and thank you all for coming to these talks. So, you know, I have a very difficult task which has been set by ESA, which is in two lectures to tell you everything about steels. Okay, so I'm going to try very hard. Uh, and um, please feel free to ask questions during the lecture or after the lecture, whatever suits you. Okay? So, um, iron has uh, many allotropes. That means the way in which the iron atoms are arranged. Uh, there are many variants, but the three most important variants are the ferrite, which is uh, at the bottom, which is body-centered cubic. Okay? Uh, then we have the austenite, which is face-centered cubic atoms located at the corners and the centers of each face, and epsilon iron, which is hexagonal close-packed. And in pure iron, the epsilon would only exist at very, very high pressures, about 130,000 atmospheres which uh, exist at the center of the earth. So we expect the iron in the center of the earth to be hexagonal close packed. And that's the uh, phase diagram for pure iron, <coughs> where we are plotting temperature versus pressure. And the thing about these uh, crystal structures is that we can change from one to the other, and we can modify these changes by adding alloying elements and by processing. And indeed, there are many other crystal structures, uh, carbide phases, intermetallic compounds, etc., that we can produce in steels. So it is the most versatile material in existence. We can control its properties from being as weak as aluminium to as strong as carbon nanotubes. Okay? Uh, someone can ask me a question about that later on. But I have a question for you. Uh, Steel means we have added carbon to the iron. So how does carbon strengthen the steel? Sorry? Interstitially dissolved. It's interstitially dissolved, but how does that strengthen the material? So don't be shy, yeah? Resisting at dislocation movement. Yes, uh, so it causes a strain field and therefore it resists dislocation motion. And uh, in, in ferrite, which is uh, shown here, uh, the carbon atom, uh, which is drawn as an open circle, is in an octahedral interstice. And you can see that that interstice is <coughs> not symmetrical. So this distance from here to here is the lattice parameter of iron, but this distance here to here is root 2 times the lattice parameter of iron. So that octahedral interstice is not a regular uh, octahedron, whereas in austenite it's perfectly regular. So can you now explain why carbon strengthens ferrite much more than austenite? You know, if I add one weight percent of carbon to ferrite, it will be enormously strengthened, but one weight percent of carbon in austenite is pretty small strengthening. Why is that? So, you know, the point that I want to emphasize is that everything I'm going to talk about today, you can use to design steel. So, you had the answer. 
uh, asymmetrical. Uh, non symmetrical uh, uh, yeah. hold for the position of the carbon atom. Right. <coughs> so you're on the right track, but it's not the perfect answer. In Sweden, you can answer five times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Some, someone told me that you have your examination, you can take five times. So <coughs> in this case, you are causing an isotropic expansion. That means a hydrostatic strain. And that has a very weak interaction with dislocations because dislocations are about uh, shear more than volume change. Okay? Uh, so this is almost acting like substitutional hardening where you know you put in an atom which has a different size into a position which is occupied by iron and you get fairly weak solid solution hardening. In this case, it's a tetragonal strain field which has a very strong interaction with the shear strain components of a dislocation strain field. And that is why we get incredible hardening from carbon in ferrite. Now, I'm going to summarize just a few of the transformations that happen in steels and classify them into two, two types. Uh, this is uh, displacive transformations, which I'll deal with in the first lecture. And here we have what we call reconstructive transformations, where you break all the bonds and you rearrange the atoms uh, into a different pattern. And therefore, there's quite a lot of diffusion, very little strain. Uh, so they're closer to equilibrium. And in displacive transformations, we have, you know, Wiedemann-Sand ferrite, bainite, martensite. And the crystallography of that is, is the same for all of those phases, more or less. Here, uh, these can only happen at temperatures where there is sufficient atomic mobility. Okay? So I'm going to begin with displacive transformations and show you the common features of those transformations. So here is a pattern. Uh, in other words, a crystal structure, we have these atoms arranged in a square array. I can change that arrangement of atoms, that means I can generate a new crystal structure by a deformation rather than by breaking the bonds. Okay, so I'll illustrate that to you. So, we've created a new crystal structure without breaking any of the bonds. But notice that the consequence is that the external shape changes. All right? So this is a very big consequence because the strains involved here, I'll show you later, are orders of magnitude greater than elastic strains. And imagine that this is happening with uh, the material surrounded by many other crystals. Then you're pushing against all those crystals. So displacive transformations like these will always be dominated by strain energy. Okay? Now, this obviously is not real, so I'm going to show you now the real uh, deformation that happens when displacive transformations happen. And, and this applies to whether it's martensite, bainite, or Wiedemann-Stadt and ferrite. So if you watch this, as the, as the temperature drops, you will see massive displacements caused by the formation of plates. Okay? You know, if you, uh, if you weren't aware that this is uh, steel, it would be like a mountain range forming in the Himalayas. The displacements are very, very large and they are real physical deformations which are driven by the fact that one phase is more stable than another. Okay? Also, uh, the structure of martensite is more stable below a certain temperature than the structure of austenite. And furthermore, we are forming these phases at a temperature where atoms cannot diffuse easily, atomic mobility. So that in steels, that temperature would be of the order of 600 degrees centigrade, below which you know, atomic mobility decreases dramatically. Now, there are certain conditions which are generic. That means they don't just apply to steels. They apply to any, any structure. So if you, if you decide one day you want to see whether martensitic transformation is possible in plutonium, all right, then what is the condition which makes martensitic transformation possible? And the condition is that you know, these things can, martensite can grow at around 1,000 meters per second, which is very, very rapid. All right? So that's one-eighth of the speed by which a space shuttle re-enters the Earth. So it's very fast. And to be able to get that transformation at such a high speed or at 
very low temperatures, you can get martensitic transformation at 4 Kelvin. Your interface between the austenite and martensite must have a certain level of coherence, all right? Uh, so that the dislocations in the interface can move without diffusion. And that level of coherence is that you must be able to find a single line in the interface which is absolutely undistorted and unrotated. If you cannot find that line between any two crystal structures, it's impossible to get martensitic transformation. So you can use that condition to decide in any material, ceramics, polymers, whatever, whether or not martensitic transformation can take place in principle. Whether it actually happens also depends on atomic mobility or lack of atomic mobility, okay? <coughs> so let's see whether this, is, this condition is satisfied for iron. Well, you must be familiar with this. If I take two unit cells of austenite, put them next to each other, face-centered cubic, uh, I can draw another unit cell, which is still austenite, all right, but is body-centered tetragonal. So there's, you know, you can represent an arrangement of atoms in an infinite number of unit cells. Or the only condition is that you must be able to stack the unit cells to fill all space, all right? So you have done nothing here except relabel the unit cell into a body-centered tetragonal cell. <coughs> and then it becomes very easy to see how to change austenite into ferrite because if I compress along here and expand uniformly along those two axes, then I get cubic, right? So this is a transformation achieved by a physical deformation. And of course, it implies that there is a certain orientation relationship between the parent and product phases, uh, but this is not what is actually observed. Yeah? We don't observe that 001 of austenite is parallel to 001 of ferrite, uh, and that the 100 of ferrite is parallel to the 110 of austenite. We observe another kind of orientation relationship in which the closed back planes are roughly parallel and the closed back directions within those planes are also roughly parallel. So I've highlighted to you already one discrepancy. But before we uh, solve that, uh, let's see whether this strain, which is very famous, the Bain strain, actually leaves a line completely coherent between the parent and product lattices. Now, there is another discrepancy. This deformation that I'm describing, which is a compression along here and uniform expansion in the horizontal plane, uh, isn't actually what you observed in that video. All right? In the video, it was like a shear deformation, which is completely different from this. And that shear deformation we can characterize as being uh, a volume expansion normal to the plane on which the plate forms. So this is not an isotropic volume expansion. And a shear deformation parallel to the plane on which it forms, so that this is actually what you observe experimentally when you characterize that shape deformation. And that seems to leave a plane completely coherent. So that would be consistent with the condition for martensitic transformation, okay? But the Bain strain, uh, I will show you, does not leave any line coherent. So, so I'm pointing out to you the discrepancies, all right? So supposing I take my austenite and I represent it as a sphere, I'll just go back here. Uh, I'll represent the austenite as a sphere. When the Bain strain happens, what will be the shape of that sphere? You take a sphere, apply the Bain strain. What will be the shape? Bats. Hmm? The bats. Yeah, it will be a, a, an ellipsoid. Yeah? Okay, so let's see <coughs> here. So this is the vertical axis of the Bain strain, and when I compress that sphere, which is yellow, I get an ellipsoid. All right? And notice that these two lines, OB and OA, become OA dashed and OB dashed, and they are not changed in length. 
Now, that does not mean that there is coherency because they are rotated. All right? So, with the brain strain, there is absolutely no line which is left unrotated and undistorted. So, it doesn't satisfy the condition for myotensitic transmission. The orientation relationship is wrong. Okay? It's not what we observe. But supposing I take the brain strain and I put a rigid body rotation so that one of these lines becomes coincident here, OA and OA dashed, then the other, other one goes more out of coincidence. So yes, we can produce one line which is fully coherent by combining the brain strain with a rigid body rotation. And that rigid body rotation that we add predicts exactly the observed orientation relationship, which is irrational. And you have the close back planes of the two lattices approximately parallel and close back directions within those two lattices. So if you know the lattice parameters of austenite and ferrite as a function of your composition, you can predict exactly the orientation relationship to be observed experimentally. Okay? So Bain strain plus rigid body rotation explains, uh, satisfies the minimum condition for myotensitic transformation, <coughs> but not the fact that we observe a shear. All right? It's still not a shear deformation. So let's see how to solve that. Okay? So I'm going to start with an austenite crystal, which has a, a shape like this. Yeah. And when this transforms into martensite, it will be like a shear. So this will change into a square, let's say. Okay? So this, this is what happens when we observe the shape change, <coughs> yeah? the observed shape. But we know that a shear cannot change austenite into martensite. Right? So this will be the wrong crystal structure. <coughs> yep. uh, the deformation that changes austenite into martensite is brain strain and rigid body rotation, which is not a shear. Right? So the observed shape change is in going from here to here is correct, but we do have the wrong crystal structure. So in order to get the right crystal structure, I have to add another deformation, which makes it equivalent to the brain strain. And that is uh, another shear on this plane. Now I have the correct crystal structure, but the wrong shape. Now why another shear? Because when I Combine two shears, there's a line which is left completely unchanged by both <coughs> shears, which is exactly the brain strain and the rigid body rotation. So the problem is that we still have an inconsistency. If we create the right crystal structure, we have the wrong shape. Now, what kind of deformation can I add which will not change the crystal structure? But it will recover the observed shape. What kind of deformation you know does not change the crystal structure? Slip? Some shear. Yeah, uh, so ordinary slip, you know. And any other? Rigid body rotation. Uh, rigid body rotation, uh, twinning. Okay? Okay. So, so these are called lattice invariant deformations. They don't change the structure, right? So if I periodically twin this, then the macroscopic shape here becomes correct. And of course, the crystal structure is correct because this deformation does not change the crystal structure. Similarly, if I periodically slip the material so that the macroscopic shape here is this, uh, then I have the correct crystal structure and I have what is apparently a shear deformation going from here to here. And this is the crystallographic theory of martensite predicts everything, you know. So you have the correct plane between the austenite and martensite, you have the correct shape. You predict that you should see twins inside martensite before they were observed, right? Before transmission electron microscopy became available, it was predicted that you should see twins. And uh, if, if you are slip, then you will be able to see with high resolution microscopy the slip steps. Okay, with the correct uh, spacing. So this is one of the early pictures showing transformation twinning inside a plate of martensite. Okay, 
And the exciting thing is that all this was predicted before it was observed by uh, Bowles and Mackenzie in Australia and Wexler, Lieberman and Reed in uh, the US simultaneously. Okay. Now, all the operations that I show here uh, are mathematically connected, all right? So, so if you predict one aspect like the nature of the shape deformation, orientation, habit plane are fixed, okay? So you have 24 different variants of martensite that can form in one grain of austenite. So there will be 24 of these, uh, each of those matrices describing the deformation, the orientation relationship and the habit plane. They are not independent. So to completely verify the theory, you have to measure three things. The plane on which the martensite forms, the orientation relationship, and the uh, shape deformation which you saw in that movie. Okay. Now, this crystallography that I've described to you, I described in terms of martensite, but it's not different for bainite or for weidman sardonferrite. You can use the same theory. It's discussed in more detail in the books that uh, uh, Professor uh, Essa showed. Now I'm going to go on to describe other aspects of calculating martensite. So, there is no change in chemical composition when martensite forms. So, we can calculate the driving force, the free energy change, when austenite changes into uh, martensite without any composition change using, you know, anything like thermocalc or empty data or you can download software from my website free of charge, okay? Martensite forms when this driving force reaches a critical value here, which I've labeled as delta G with the subscript ms. And that critical value, uh, we have equations telling you how that uh, is fixed as a function of composition because it's determined by the strength of the austenite, all right? The stronger the austenite, the greater the driving force you need to uh, achieve martensitic transformation and some other factors for example the strain energy due to the shape deformation and so on okay but we know this as a function of composition etc so if you have this value you can predict the temperature at which martensite will start <coughs> so tomorrow if i said look i want to make an iron gold alloy uh, all you need to do is in thermocalc or something like that, put in uh, gold into iron, work out the free energy change you expect, and then compare against the critical value here, which is of the order of a thousand joules per mole, okay, uh, to get the MS temperature. So, <coughs> you have many empirical equations for MS as a function of composition, but if you want to do something unusual, or very high alloy concentrations, you can do the calculation of the Martin size start temperature using thermodynamics, okay? <coughs> and the other thing is, um, we call Martin Cedric transformations a-thermal. So here is an equation describing how the volume fraction of Martin site varies as a function of undercooling below the Martin size start temperature. There's no time in this, okay? Uh, this beta has a value of minus 0.011 roughly, Koisten and Marburger. <coughs> so you can even calculate how the amount of martensite increases with undercooling. There's no time on this, uh, you know, if I cool to this temperature, I will get 50% martensite, no more, okay? So that's why we call this a thermal transformation. But, you know, it's not strictly a thermal. It's because our equipment cannot measure the rate at which the martensite forms. It's, it's just, it's a first order transformation in thermodynamics. That means it involves nucleation and growth. And therefore, time must be there. It's simply very, very fast for us to be able to measure. But a long time ago, <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll come back to, I'll come back to this point. Uh, so I, I said it's a first order transformation involving nucleation and growth. Now, we don't just have 
austenite to body-centered cubic or body-centered tetragonal martensite. You can also get hexagonal closed back martensite, right? Uh, it's another form of iron. And this is the only example that I know in all of the literature where nucleation has been directly observed, right? Classical nucleation is when you're looking at a collection of atoms and they are jumping about and there happens to be a fluctuation which gives you the correct structure and if it's above a certain size then it will survive, yeah? But martensitic nucleation happens by the dissociation of dislocations and for the FCC to HCP it's very, very simple. You have Shockley partials which are A by 6, 1, 1, 2 dislocations uh, coming out from A by 2, 1, 1, 0 which separate out and in between you have a fault. And the stacking sequence at the fault is the correct one for hexagonal closed packed, right? But I said to you that hexagonal iron is stable at very high pressures. Now, what does that mean? That means that its density is greater than that of austenite or ferrite. So you cannot explain hexagonal martensite simply by saying you have dislocations, dissociating, and changing the stacking sequence. Changing the stacking sequence doesn't give you a volume change, right? Uh, so, this was an experiment done uh, back in 1979 in Birmingham University. If you look at a, a fault, that means a three-layer thick HCP region with the correct stacking sequence, you see these fringes because the fault is inclined with respect to the beam. And the fault is bounded by these partial dislocations. If I use an imaging vector which is at 90 degrees to the Burgers vector of those dislocations, then the contrast disappears completely. All right? And that's, that's how we can analyze the displacements. So here you can see the contrast has disappeared. <coughs> But don't believe me, because it hasn't disappeared completely, right? Yeah? There is residual contrast because there is a volume change normal to the fault. It's a volume contraction. And it's a brilliant experiment because they also varied the concentration to change the volume uh, contraction. And you can see that the residual contrast gets stronger as the volume contraction becomes larger. So, this is the first ever observation of a nucleus, all right? Now, you can see that they are not yet growing. You have to go to a lower temperature and then it becomes unstable and produces hexagonal closed back martensite, okay? <coughs> I don't think there is any other example of phase transformation where a nucleus has been directly observed, okay? So, going back to this story, uh, we call this uh, a-thermal martensite because there isn't a time dependence in that equation. But if you have dislocations in the interface, there will be an activation energy because they are at an equilibrium position inside the lattice and to move to the next one, uh, they have to surmount a small barrier that's called a piles barrier. <coughs> so, uh, back uh, in the 1940s, Kurjumov and Maximova showed that if you produce martensite at a sufficiently low temperature, all right, so you can see these are cryogenic temperatures, yeah, then you can pick up a C curve, exactly like uh, bainite, Wiedmannstein, ferrite, etc. Because after all, it's a first order transformation, that means it involves nucleation and growth. So there must be time, but you need to, <coughs> you need to slow down the reaction by alloying so that you can suppress the transformation temperature before you pick up isothermal martensite. Okay? So they, you shouldn't think of martensite as something strange that forms instantaneously. The fact that you can observe martensite and austenite simultaneously means that it's a first order transformation involving nucleation and growth. <coughs> Everyone happy? Okay. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's see how stress would influence this transformation. Because, you know, you're all familiar with trip steels. 
Well, the interaction of a, a stress with a displacive transformation is no different from the interaction of a stress with slip planes. Okay? You know, when you take a single crystal and you pull it, certain slip systems will operate first. All right? And that you determine by seeing which gives you the maximum shear stress on the slip system in the shear direction. The same applies to martensitic transformation. You have a shear strain and a volume change, and an applied stress will interact with the shear strain. Uh, if you resolve the applied stress onto the habit plane, that's the shear stress on the habit plane, and this is the normal stress on the habit plane. So exactly as in ordinary slip. But we also have a volume change, and that's why we have this additional term. So the energy of that interaction is simply the normal stress on the habit plane. So your applied stress you resolve into a normal and a shear stress on that plane. And you add these up and you get effectively a mechanical driving force. So even if you are above the martensite start temperature and you apply a stress, you can stimulate martensite to form simply because you are adding mechanical free energy. To the chemical free energy term, all right? And this this uh, uh, equation is very simple to calculate. And if you go back now to our plot of free energy versus uh, temperature, this is what I showed you earlier: that when the driving force for uh, uh, transformation in which there is no composition change reaches a critical value, we trigger martensite, all right? Now, if you also have a tensile stress, then you add another term to the delta G gamma alpha, right? Because it's assisting transformation. You, you want to think about displacive transformations as deformations which you can stimulate by applying stress, but at the same time the crystal structure changes. So unlike slip or twinning, you know, where the crystal <coughs> structure doesn't change, in the case of displacive transformations, the same physics applies, but you change the crystal structure. So if I add additional driving force, to the chemical term, then my martensite start temperature is raised. So if, if room temperature is here, okay, this alloy will be fully austenitic at room temperature because MS is much below room temperature, but in the presence of stress, you will trigger martensite. Okay? Not only that, but you will trigger the martensite plates which have a specific high value of U. You know, there are 24 possible orientations. Some of them will be more favored. That means they'll have a greater value of U than others, okay? So you will create, um, create a material in which you have texture, okay? So this is uh, just a, an illustrative plot of how you expect the martensite start temperature to increase with applied stress. So these calculations are straightforward. And here is an experiment where you take a tapered tensile specimen so that you know the stress decreases as you go along this direction and then you pull it here the uh, test temperature is minus 44 degrees centigrade this is a heavily alloyed material and you can see that as a function of the stress the martensite content increases linearly all right so the stress is generating all that transformation but this is a polycrystalline specimen, and yet you can see that the plates that form are roughly at 45 degrees to the applied stress, because those are the planes of maximum shear stress. Right? So you are selecting variants which have the greatest interaction with the stress, and therefore you are creating what we call texture, that means a non-random distribution of crystals. Right? Um, and you can predict this. So if you know the orientations of all the austenite grains, then you can predict in every single grain which plate of martensite is likely to be favored. And therefore, you can predict the total orientation of martensite plates, in other words, the texture. And this is the calculated texture, and this is the measured texture. Okay? So by when you form martensite under a stress, it will not lead to a random microstructure. It will lead to orientations which are aligned, 
in the most favorable way with respect to the stress, and therefore you will produce texture. Now this, this uh, calculation here, and the comparison with experiments, is misleading. All right? You can see there is, uh, there is a correlation there, but each dot on here simply represents orientation, whereas each dot on here also has intensity. Right? So let me illustrate why it's misleading. So here uh, we have um, the sort of uh, pole figure. These are the crystallographic poles of this plate, and these are the crystallographic poles of this plate. If I change the volume fraction so that this becomes larger and this becomes smaller, this plot does not change, right? Because we are not modeling intensity, just the um, orientations. And what this should look like is this, that the intensity of the red poles is greater, okay? So the literature is riddled with papers which say that we have good agreement between the measured <coughs> and the calculate a texture, but they are not calculating the volume fractions of the phases, simply the orientations of the phases, okay? <coughs> okay, so going back to trip steels, you, you know, you saw that the chemical composition here is 28% nickel and 0.4 carbon, right? Now, if you are working on iron, people are very concerned about cost. If you are working on graphene, they don't care about cost, okay? Um, and the reason is, you know, we want to use iron, okay? Iron and its alloys. <laughs> and 24 weight percent of nickel is not affordable, yeah? So we've got to make trip steels uh, in which uh, you induce martensitic transformation by stress because that helps to relieve stress concentrations and it increases the work hardening of the material, which gives you a greater uniform elongation. But we cannot afford so much nickel in general. So, uh, trip steels that are fully austenitic are expensive. So, how can we produce a very cheap austenite? Okay? Which is the alloying element which is the, the most effective in stabilizing austenite? Carbon. Yeah? Incredibly cheap. In fact, when you make steel, yeah, someone here is doing a PhD on steel making, you actually blow oxygen to remove excess carbon. Okay? <coughs> now, the only problem is uh, when we stabilize austenite by carbon, uh, any martensite that you, you get will be high carbon martensite. And high carbon martensite, untempered, is brittle, right? But let's see how we can get over that problem. The first thing is that we need to produce this austenite and yet maintain many other engineering properties, right? It, it isn't just a question of producing austenite. So <coughs> the bainite transformation is very similar to martensite, okay? And I'm going to summarize about 45 years of work in one slide. So imagine that the bainite forms exactly like martensite, but it's forming at a temperature where carbon can be mobile. Then immediately after transformation, you get the partitioning of carbon into the austenite, and that precipitates as cementite normally. But you can kill this process by adding silicon to the steel. So you can stop this reaction here, in which case you are left with these plates of ferrite and carbon enriched austenite. All right? So that would be a good microstructure to have. And the fact that uh, silicon stops cementite from forming has been known for more than 100 years in cast ions. Yeah? So cast ions which are rich in silicon uh, will have uh, um, lots of uh, graphite instead of cementite. And those which are poor in silicon will have lots of cementite. All right? And in terms of um, designing an alloy, we need to know a bit more than that. We need to know the thermodynamics of silicon dissolving in cementite, right? Uh, but the problem is that the solubility of silicon in cementite is negligible, right? So you cannot actually do experimental measurements. When you cannot do experimental measurements, but you still need the data, 
the method that you use is first principles calculations, which use electron theory. All right? So you take uh, a unit cell of cementite, and you pull out an iron atom, substitute it with silicon, and work out the uh, change in energy. Okay? <coughs> now, this is at zero Kelvin. And then you assume that that will be valid at high temperatures. But you know, beggars can't be choosers. Okay? So uh, here we are. We have substituted silicon. And you see there's a massive increase in energy when we substituted an iron atom with silicon. We can use that number in things like thermocalc or empty data and work out the effect of silicon on cementite precipitation. Okay. Okay, so um, this is the kind of steel that emerges, where the average carbon concentration is quite small, 0.15 carbon. Yeah? Remember, you know, when you're designing a steel, you have to maintain many parameters. Right? You cannot spot weld a steel which will have a higher carbon content. All right? uh, spot welding, you know, there's about 5,000 of these welds in a typical <coughs> car. So if you cannot spot weld an automotive steel, it's not going to be useful. Right? So the carbon has to be low. You've got uh, the silicon and uh, a certain amount of hardenability. And you generate a structure like this, where most of it is ferrite. I'll talk about ferrite in the next lecture. But then you have this retained austenite, which has a high carbon concentration of about 1.2 percent because the ferrite that forms partitions carbon, and then the bainite that is formed inside that austenite partitions carbon again. So you're left with very cheap austenite, right? which, is, uh, which has a volume fraction of about 15 <coughs> percent, but a high carbon concentration of roughly 1.2 percent. So when you pull this material, it will transform into untempered brittle martensite. Now, why don't we need to worry about that? Well, let's say we have an austenite grain size of 120 micrometers, and we form a martensite plate in it. And this is a, a 1 weight percent carbon alloy. You can see that the plate cracks, OK? Spontaneously, without you doing anything, it's broken. But notice that there is a spacing between the cracks. Okay? This region is not cracked. This region is not cracked. Uh, if I make my austenite grain size finer than this, okay, that means the martensite plates will be uh, of a length equal to the distance between those cracks, then the cracks start to disappear. Okay? So, the thing to learn from this is that when the austenite grain size is very small and you produce untampered high carbon martensite, it will not crack. And the reason why it will not crack is that there is a, a theory in composites <coughs> where you add you know, short fibers inside your polymer, and you cannot transfer stress onto the short fibers unless they are bigger than uh, this dimension times 2. Okay? So if you make your martensite plate sufficiently small, it's difficult to transfer stress onto those plates and to break them. Okay? And if you look at the trip-assisted steel, you know, the great grain size of the austenite is actually, whoops, where am I? Uh, austenite is quite fine. Yeah? And that's why when you pull it, the martensite does not crack. Okay? I'll come back to this lesson later. Now, there are other effects of austenite grain size. Okay? So here is a large austenite grain, and we have a plate of martensite, and a small austenite grain with a plate of martensite. We know that the martensite start temperature decreases as we make the grain size smaller. Now, why is that? Well, I have uh, some experimental method to detect the martensite start temperature. And that experimental method will have a certain amount of accuracy, say a dilatometer, right? I can't pick up a strain which is smaller than uh, a certain amount. So if I have a large austenite grain, and I'm forming large plates of martensite, 
then the recorded Martin's eye star temperature will be greater because, you know, I've satisfied, I've overcome the accuracy of the equipment at an earlier stage of transformation. Here I have to build many Martin's eye plates before I get the same volume fraction which is greater than the sensitivity of the equipment. All right? So, this is how your measured Martin's eye start temperature will change according to the austenite grain size. It's only sensitive when the grain size is small. All right? And you can express that effect about the sensitivity of the equipment in terms of an equation like this. It's fairly straightforward to do this calculation. Okay. The second effect uh, of uh, uh, austenite grain size is that, of course, you know, we use thermomechanical processing where we are not using equiaxed austenite grains, but we pancake the austenite grains so that they are flattened. And that effectively, you know, going from a structure which is uh, a tetrachidecahedron to a pancake shape gives you a smaller mean linear intercept. That means the size of the plate of mind inside that can grow. So you can take that into account in your calculations as well. And the third effect is more subtle. So plastic strain as opposed to stress, right? A small amount of strain will help martensitic transformation because it generates more nuclei. All right? But a large amount of strain, plastic strain, creates a lot of dislocation debris and it will oppose the transformation because you, know, you have this coherent interface which is trying to move through a forest of dislocations. If your forest of dislocations is very, very intense, it cannot move and that's called mechanical stabilization. So, if I take a, a cylindrical specimen, right, and I compress it inside your Gleeble machine, yeah, then the deformation is not uniform because you can see that the sample has barreled here, okay? So, the strain, plastic strain along here is zero, okay, because it's touching the platens, and the plastic strain here is a maximum. And notice that here we have a lot of transformation. Okay? Here, almost none, completely suppressed. Okay? So if you put sufficient dislocations into your structure, you can suppress the transformation completely. And I won't go into details, but it's possible to calculate this quantitatively because you know, this is the forest of dislocations that an interface has to move through. And that means you have to add an extra term to the driving force which can overcome those forests of dislocation if transformation has to proceed. So, just to summarize, uh, it's possible to do calculations of the effect of plastic strain, effect of austenite grain size, effect of stress, and effect of chemical composition on the transformation, and the crystallography. These are the sort of curves that are published in literature we show you the volume fraction of austenite changing as a function of plastic strain for trip steels, and all those uh, you can estimate before you make your uh, design your alloy. So let me just summarize how we are doing. So so far we can estimate everything about crystallography. We have a condition which says whether or not martensitic transformation can actually happen in any system. All right and that is the requirement that you must be able to find one line completely coherent. Uh, we know uh, the atomic structure of martensite and we can calculate the effects of chemical composition using thermodynamics. Even if you are adding strange elements to iron, you can estimate those as long as the thermodynamic data are there. I mentioned the effect of stress producing non-random microstructures. So that's what we call crystallographic texture. And, you know, magnetic effects have the same influence. That means they will favor certain variants to form out of the 24 possible in the austenite grain. And, you know, we know that in practice, we talk about martensite as being athermal. But if we had sufficient time resolution, we would pick up 
the time dependence of Martin's site as well. We know the effects of plastic strain. And this is an important point. Just a very simple idea that if you make the austenite grain size sufficiently fine, you can even use large carbon concentrations without compromising ductility. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Okay, so let's imagine we have to design a steel with an impossible combination of properties, right? So I had a project with this title. So what are these impossible combinations? Well, we've got to make it stronger than two gigapascals, right? Now, just to remind you, one pascal is the weight of an apple on one square meter, because an apple weighs one newton, all right? So two gigapascals means two billion apples on one square meter, all right? Incredible strength. Uh, the requirement is also for ductility and both ductility at conventional strain rates and at high strain rates and the impact toughness at minus 40 degrees centigrade should be 30 joules furthermore it should be valuable right a two gigapascal material should be valuable and of course it must be cheap yeah this is like and you should be able to make this large in all dimensions and suitable for mass production, right? Now, um, the way in which we went about doing this is as follows. So this is the actual flow chart from the research proposal. Okay, so forget most of this, but we want to produce martensite, okay? And remember this has to be weldable and all the rest of it, all right? How can we produce crack resisting martensite? By having extremely fine austenite grain size, less than four micrometers in size, okay? And I go back to this result, which shows that the cracking of martensite diminishes as I reduce my austenite grain size, okay? Because of the stress transfer issue. And there's no way I can produce an austenite grain size, which is equiaxed, of four micrometers in mass production. It's not possible, mm -hmm. okay? So we have to do something else. We have to do thermomechanical processing to flatten these grains so much that the effective grain size is reduced. So this is the extent of pancaking that we produced in this material, which has only 0.3 weight percent carbon. Uh, so imagine that was one equiax grain of austenite. It's really, really, elongated now. So the effective grain size is much smaller. But notice uh, all these features here. Those are deformation bands inside the austenite. So even one of these is subdivided into many, many small regions. Okay? So uh, the method, of course, is suitable for mass production. And we've added vanadium carbides to stop those austenite grains from changing during deformation, okay? Vanadium carbide, because to get that level of flattening, we need the finished rolling temperature to be quite low, something of the order of 750 degrees centigrade, okay? If you use vanadium carbide, it precipitates at high temperatures with 0.3 carbon in our material, and then it's not suitable for low temperature processing, okay? Okay, so let me just show you one very beautiful way of showing that we have broken up the austenite into very fine regions, right? Now, supposing I take one grain of austenite and I do EBSD, that means electron backscattered diffraction from that single grain, undeformed austenite grain, then I will see the 24 variants of martensite, okay? And indeed, that's what you see, okay? So this is a single austenite grain in undeformed night and all these correspond to the 24 variants of martensite that we get. In the pancake material, single grain of austenite, this becomes like a cloud because there are lots and lots of orientation gradients within that single grain of austenite. So you <coughs> effectively you've destroyed the austenite grain structure so much that the martensite plates are very, very fine. Okay? And I'm just going to show you one result. This is the uh, nanostructured bainite, which I haven't talked about. 
and we achieved very high strength and reasonable toughness. But with this material, which is martensitic, you know, we consistently get a toughness of 75 megapascal root meters with a strength greater than 2 gigapascals and mass produced. And it is also weldable. So you can see, if I take my nanostructure bainite and weld it, it will crack in front of your eyes, okay, spontaneously. This is weldable, okay. Okay, so um, phase transformation theory isn't just uh, about the basic science, but you should use it in order to produce something interesting. And you can use it to produce something interesting. Um, I mentioned to you that this slide summarizes the mechanism of the bainite transformation, but you know that there are two kinds of bainite, the upper bainite and lower bainite. Uh, imagine that the plate of uh, bainite forms exactly like martensite, but because we are forming it at high temperatures, the carbon diffuses into the austenite and then precipitates as cementite between the plates. That's your structure of upper bainite. But if you are forming the bainite at a relatively low temperature, then there is an opportunity for carbides to precipitate also inside the plate, and less carbon is partitioned, and therefore you end up with the classical lower bainite structure. Now, the important point here is that this forms exactly like modern size. So the thermodynamics are the same, that we must form at a temperature where diffusion-less transformation is possible. Okay? So there is a concept that we can use. This is the free energy curve for ferrite, and this is the free energy curve for austenite. And normally, you know, if you draw a common tangent, that gives you the equilibrium compositions of ferrite and austenite. And if I extrapolate that onto a plot of temperature versus carbon, that gives you my equilibrium phase boundary, A1 and A3 temperatures. But focus on this point, okay, where austenite and ferrite of the same composition have the same free energy. All right? If I have austenite of this composition, it's thermodynamically impossible for it to transform without a composition change because you get an increase in free energy. If I have austenite to this side of this green point, it's possible for it to transform without a composition change. Okay? The free energy change will be smaller than if we form the equilibrium fractions, but it's possible thermodynamically. And so if I extrapolate the locus of these points as a function of temperature, then I get what's known as a T0 curve. On this side, it's impossible to get diffusion-less transformation. On this side, it is possible in principle. Okay? So if I'm forming bainite, and it forms exactly like martensite, but carbon then partitions, then the first plate of bainite will make the austenite richer. So the next plate of bainite is forming from richer austenite. And this can only go on until you hit the T0 curve, right, until the composition of the austenite hits the T0 curve. And if, if the carbon is never supersaturated in the bainite, then the transformation would continue until the equilibrium curve is reached. So it's a very, very simple way of deciding what the carbon is doing during the growth of bainite. Okay? And there are vast numbers of experimental results which show that this is the case. Now, when we add silicon, we stop the carbide precipitation from austenite. Uh, so the composition of the austenite will be given by this curve when the reaction stops. Okay? And that's how we retain austenite. Produce this beautiful structure. Uh, the scale here is one micrometer, so these are about a quarter micrometer thick plates with nice films of austenite in between, which are carbon enriched. So it's like a composite material where you have a combination of strength and toughness from the films of the austenite, which do not have a ductile brittle transition temperature. So this should be an ideal uh, microstructure. You know, you've got strength, you've got toughness, okay? So the retained austenite will give us a trip effect. There's no ductile brittle transition. It's even a barrier to the diffusion of hydrogen. Yeah, the diffusion coefficient of hydrogen in austenite is much less than in ferrite. 
there's no cementite. Cementite in strong steels is a brittle phase, all right? And the amount of carbon left inside the magnetic ferret is quite small. I told you that carbon has an intense hardening effect in ferrite, and that makes the ferret brittle if you put too much carbon in the ferret, okay? So this is an ideal structure. So it should have good toughness in addition to strength. But when you measure, the toughness is extremely poor. Yeah, so, you know, the impact transition temperature here is 100 degrees centigrade. You really want to use the material in this temperature range, right? So something is very wrong with our concept here. We expect it to be very nice, but it turns out to have very poor toughness. <coughs> and the reason for the very poor toughness is this, that the T0 condition stops the transformation from consuming large regions of austenite, which are then retained. Okay? Now, large regions are bad, because when the martensite is triggered in those regions, the plates will be coarse and they will crack spontaneously. Okay? So, this is like designing a very nice structure containing films of austenite and throwing a brick, which is the size of 50 micrometers, inside your steel. Okay? So, there's apparently nothing we can do about this because the reaction will not go further than the T0 curve. Okay? So let's, uh, what we want is a greater volume fraction of bainite to get rid of those large regions of arsenite. And if this is my T0 curve, then the volume fraction of bainite is given by the lever rule, this divided by this distance, where this is the carbon concentration of the ferrite, which is more or less zero. Okay? So this is the equation for the volume fraction of bainite. So, can you tell me three ways in which I can increase the volume fraction of bainite so that those large regions are consumed? Increasing the temperature? Sorry? Increasing the temperature? Uh, decreasing the temperature. Yeah, that's right, because that will, uh, you know, if I'm here, then this distance is greater. Okay? That's one. What is the limitation? Up to MS. Correct. Yeah, so we want to avoid martensite, all right? Second? Stress. Yeah? Stress? Applying stress? Uh, we can do that, okay? But um, we want to make large objects, okay? Just look at that equation. What will increase the fraction of bainite? I can take a rest while you're thinking. Uh, so X bar is the average carbon concentration in your steel. So I could, I could reduce that, right? Now that won't compromise strength because we are increasing the fraction of bainite, okay? And the third thing is, of course, I have substitutional alloying elements which can shift the position of the T0 curve to larger concentrations, right? So three very simple ideas. This is the original material, which has a very poor toughness. Here we have decreased the carbon concentration by a factor of two. And here we have substituted manganese for nickel, which shifts the T0 curve to larger concentrations, as you can see here, okay? And we end up with a structure which is much, much finer. Here, you can see those two alloys, one with half the carbon, one with nickel. And without doing any experiments other than to make those steels, you reduce the impact transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade. Okay. Just from a knowledge of the phase transformation theory governing the bainite transformation, that it stops at T0, and we've got to do something to progress the transformation so that the large regions of austenite are consumed. And this forms the basis of the rail technology. Normal rails are made from perlite, okay? but they're not tough. Here we have no hard particles at all. all right? This is a mixture of bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. And you can see here that uh, 
derailing contact fatigue. Where is um, my colleague over there? Let me just uh, remind my Jens. Yeah? We were talking about rolling contact fatigue today. And this material doesn't undergo rolling contact fatigue in full scale tests. Yeah? So these tests were stopped. Whereas these are the martensitic and politic rails. It's my hotel key, so I shouldn't forget it. Yeah. Okay, so that's um, the resistance to rolling contact fatigue and wear resistance. So this is the carbide free bionitic rail uh, after 90 million gross tons of traffic. And this is the head hardened politic rail. Okay. And uh, you can see this in another way that it also reduces the wear rate on the wheel. The only one that actually does that. Okay. And if you travel from, uh, so I know that we are negotiating Brexit at the moment, unfortunately, but this connection will always remain. So this is the channel tunnel. And these rails are installed in the channel tunnel. Now, normally when you go in the tunnel, you don't see anything. It's dark, yeah? Because they don't show you the water that's leaking in. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> but uh, this was when the rail was being installed. And you can see that uh, uh, it's functioning and has been functioning for many, many years. Okay. Now, let me show you a problem which is unsolved, all right? So now, uh, steels containing epsilon martensite are becoming more commercially viable, all right? And uh, epsilon martensite looks, uh, looks like this. In particular, very high manganese steels are now a known technology that can be produced in large quantities. POSCO, for example, has the technology. And that's what epsilon martensite looks like. When we try and apply the same methods of uh, using thermodynamics to calculate the martin size start temperature, it's weird. A lot of the alloys have a positive driving force. Okay? That means that the thermodynamic data must be wrong. Okay? Um, for these, uh, these large manganese concentrations and other alloying elements, you know, e even these are wrong because the driving force is just too small to even sustain the strain energy due to the transformation. Okay? Uh, and you can prove, uh, prove that it's wrong by doing first principles calculations for a few examples to show that actually the free energy change should be very negative instead of positive. Okay? So the only, only uh, option is uh, so these are the cases which are well behaved, where we have a large driving force negative, okay? And using the normal thermodynamic method that I showed you, you can calculate the temperatures. But of course, you, you know, there's a very large number which don't follow, uh, follow the calculation because you cannot have a positive free energy change when you have a transformation, yeah? So uh, to prove that there's something wrong with the thermodynamic data, we did first principles calculations. Uh, first, uh, you do it for pure iron just to make sure that, uh, you know, everything is in the right direction and, you know, you get similar numbers from thermodynamic measurements as well as from first principles <coughs> methods. And this is an alloy which showed a positive free energy change, but with first principles methods we show that actually it's a negative free energy change. So a lot of work needs to be done uh, for, for this thermodynamic data for epsilon martensite. Otherwise, it obeys all the theory that I gave you earlier. That, for example, there's an austenite grain size effect, which is following the same equation without modification to the alpha prime martensite. And what we can do at the moment, because the thermodynamic data, if somebody is bothered to look at them, will take a long time to generate, yeah? is use empirical equations, just like, you know, in ordinary steels, empirical equations were there first. Right? So these equations exist if you want to calculate the martin size start temperature. And uh, there's no reason why these equations should be linear. And the most general method of treating this problem is using neural networks, okay? which are a machine learning technique. And then you also get a really good indication of uh, the errors that you should expect in your prediction. So all these models exist and they can be downloaded and used if you want to design 
the steels, but more work is needed on high manganese steels and the thermodynamic data. So I think uh, we started at 10.15 and the talk is supposed to last from 60 to 90 minutes. So we have, um, we have about 15 minutes for questions, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. So I'll be happy to answer questions, okay? Yeah. Um, you said that uh, when Martin's ice wants to transform, it has 24 variants. Mm. So uh, consider that we have Martin's lytic structure, uh, maybe a little bit austenite films between. But then if we give some more energy, like uh, heating. Like? For example, heating. Yeah. But, you know, to, to uh, give enough energy to the system, what will happen for the orientation of these uh, 24 orients? Will hmm. they grow? Will they like uh, change their orientation to one specific? Okay, so, so that's a, a good question. And the question is, you know, uh, suppose we have 24 orientations of martensite in a grain of austenite. When we temper the material, do you expect some orientations to grow with respect to others? Um, so, I, the real answer is, I don't know, okay? Um, but uh, you would need to sort of uh, give it a pretty high temperature heat treatment before they start to recrystallize and form. But the real answer is, I, I don't know. Uh, again, it's the same. It's not different here. Yeah. But you could you could use your ABSD to yeah, check. I actually uh, have seen something like that that hmm. they grow and they significantly uh, decrease the dBT the temperature, so it's okay. a very bad impact toughness after that. But uh, the thing is that um, I I see that uh, they grow, so it means that the mountains I packet will much larger, hmm. but I don't know uh, how it can change because it's a sheer deformation. Hmm. There is no austenite that they can uh, play. <laughs> so maybe only the uh, theory for recovery and recrystallization uh -huh. is relevant, you know, because the transformation is finished. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Ah. Under the influence of temperature alone. Yes. Yeah. And if no question, I have also a second one. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's a small concentration of carbon in ferrite, which uh, we expect normally from phase diagram. But um, I saw in one of your uh, yeah. videos that it could be higher. Correct. So can you explain a little bit more how is it possible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so that's a really interesting story. The phase diagram that we normally look at is between cubic ferrite and austenite. <coughs> okay, and there, you know, at room temperature, the solubility of carbon in ferrite is next to zero. Yeah, uh, and you can only measure that using internal friction, for example. Okay, but you know, uh, the Bain strain. In, in austenite, you have uh, three octahedral interstices per ion atom. In ferrite, you have uh, <coughs> just, sorry, in austenite, you have one octahedral interstice per ion atom. In ferrite, you have three, okay? That means that when the Bain strain operates, all the carbon atoms end up in one sublattice of octahedral interstice. So that means it's tetragonal, okay? Uh, immediately on transformation is tetragonal. So we need to look at the equilibrium between tetragonal ferrite and austenite. And when you do that, we, we did these calculations, you find that the solubility increases dramatically. Yes, something like 0.2, 0 0.3 weight percent depending on temperature. And then we measured, uh, we went back uh, uh, using synchrotron x-rays because you get much higher intensities. Uh, 
and we measured the COA ratio of bainitic ferrite and it was finite, you know, it wasn't uh, one, it, it was more than one. And then when we temper the material and allow the carbon atoms to precipitate, the COA ratio becomes one. And if you look at all the old X-ray data, then you find that um, the, <coughs> okay, we don't have a pen. So if you look at the um, intensity versus uh, two theta, okay, and uh, look at the zero one one peak of ferrite, it should have a perfect symmetry, all right, a Gaussian shape, but actually it doesn't, all right. Uh, it, it's uh, asymmetrical. Now, the reason why you can't separate out the 0, 1, 1 and 1, 1, 0 peaks is because there's a lot of strain in the material. So you can only separate them out using retrial analysis. So in the past, we have assumed that it's cubic. But in many cases, we find it isn't. And now those results have been confirmed by many groups in the world, including uh, neutron diffraction, lattice imaging locally, and uh, even measuring thermal expansion coefficients, which are anisotropic in the Bainitic ferrite in Delft University. Yeah. So I didn't include all that detail in today's talk. Yeah. <coughs> And then if we have the isothermal transformation, uh, for how, I mean, for how long would be the diffusion of the carbon would happen mm. from the ferrite to astomite? Yeah, so that was, uh, so that's a very good question that, you know, if we have tetragonal ferrite and we have isothermal transformation, then surely there's plenty of time for carbon to move. And that was what caused me a lot of pain because carbon can diffuse rapidly, yeah? And yet it's not. So I tried many explanations until we calculated the phase diagram for equilibrium between tetragonal and tetragonal ferrite and uh, cubic arsenite. If the solubility, equilibrium solubility is high, then that carbon will simply not move until it precipitates. Yeah. So even if we increase the, uh, I mean, isothermal transformation for very long time, you will not have the more stable Un until you get some sort of precipitation, okay. yeah. And of course, if you go to higher temperatures, that precipitation happens earlier, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, so the first results were on transformation at 200 degrees centigrade, yeah. Uh, and as you, as you increase the transformation temperature, the amount of carbon that stays in the ferrite is smaller. I have a question about the incubation period before benitic <coughs> ferrite is formed. Right. How could that be explained, and how is that depending on alloying contents and yeah. um, temperature? Right, right. So, you know, if you look at a, a TTT diagram, then um, it has a shape like this, and therefore there's an incubation time. So the incubation time, uh, corresponds to your limit of detectability. So if you look at Martinside start temperature, for example, if you use acoustic emission, the MS is much, much higher than using dilatometry and so on. Uh, so if you describe this using uh, a Rami theory, then uh, you can say, okay, if my detection limit is 1%, then this will be the incubation time. But the incubation time is not a uh, not a real incubation time, it's depending on your detection limit. Yeah, partly, but you also mm. uh, explained in the beginning that initially you have carbon diffusion during uh, equilib uh, equilibrium of the, of, of the nucleation. Mm. Yes, yes, yeah. Which so, de definitely time definitely yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is the time temperature transformation diagram, okay? And this is what would happen if you were observing the system, okay? So let's say this is the length of a plate, 
and uh, this is uh, a time. Nucleation, of course, has a time period of incubation. So a particle that is nucleated here will have that as an incubation period. It didn't exist be before this temperature. And another one which is here will have a different incubation period because it's a, a statistical process. Uh, but this is this incubation time is not the same as this, which is what I was trying to say. Yeah. In any any nucleation and growth reaction, the existence of a particle comes at a finite time because there's an attempt frequency and so. On. Yeah. yeah so you're right. How is this influenced by alloying elements? Yeah. So um, the main effect is through the chemical driving force. Okay. So if you, if you look at uh, the displacive transformation, so let's, let's assume this is displacive. And we have the reconstructive transformations here. The effect of alloying elements is much greater on this than on this. Because here, they don't diffuse. They only influence the difference in free energy. Whereas here, you have that thermodynamic effect. But in addition, they are slow to diffuse. So for these reactions, the effect is much smaller, but it's calculable. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, you have solutes in, in, in the metal that is distorting the lattice, and that must, to some extent, influence it. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Thanks. Mm. <coughs> Was the, I mean, the toughness was much higher compared to nanostructured vanilla. Correct. Uh, is it, as you said, is a thermomechanical process in working yeah. this one, which is not in the uh, nanostructured vanilla? Would it, uh, would it be much more expensive compared to nanobainitic, and what is the limitation of this CO2? So, so the nanobainite, you cannot weld, right? So, so you can use it for shafts or for bearings or armor. If you can weld something, it becomes much more useful. So this can be mass produced. And uh, we've, we produce about 40 tons of material in thicknesses varying from 6 millimeters to about 50 millimeters. And you know, there's no problems in producing those sizes in the form of plates. Yeah? So we are hoping uh, to use it in addition for, uh, for earth moving equipment for the beds of uh, trucks where you transport minerals and then you tip them out and so on. Yeah. So um, we are doing um, impact tumbler wear tests, right? where you have granite hitting material. <coughs> mm. <coughs> So far, all the questions have been from the front. <laughs> OK, I think they're happy. Yes. OK. Taking a lot. OK. That is the second talk in the afternoon. Yes, yes, you're right. OK. OK. okay. So okay. I would like to thank you for this nice presentation. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm.